Welcome to SolarWorks for Illinois. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today is April 3rd. Today's a special edition of SolarWorks for Illinois. We're going to be talking about the economy and the impact of the COVID-19 disease and the COVID virus on the economy. My guest today is David Lim. He is a clean energy entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of Terra2, a startup based in California. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Tim, for having me. So you and I got to know each other about two months ago, and you're finding your way through the clean energy jungle. Tell us a little bit about what Terra2 is up to and why you started Terra2. Sure. So Terra2 is a startup. We launched in November 2019, and we are reimagining green investing. So what does that mean? We are enabling everyday people, yourself and me, unaccredited, accredited people, to invest into green infrastructure. So renewable energy. Um, so we want to accelerate the transition, the clean transition as fast as we can, which is a group of young kids, uh, young guys uh, with technology, technological knowledge. And we want to apply that to the industry in order to uh, move things a little faster. Um, so we're very much pro clean energy um, for a little bit of a younger generation. Um, sure. And, and, and this, is, this is great. This is very important. We need to make it uh, more accessible, right? The cl yes. For ordinary people to invest in clean energy uh, is, is, a, is a great cause. So thank you for doing that. And we're not going to dwell too much on, on cl you know, pure, the clean energy um, mm. economy, but let's, let's quickly shift now to the, the COVID crisis, uh, this week, there were several announcements about unemployment in the United States, and you have written a, an interesting blog post, uh, which people can find at Terra2, T-E-R-R-A, uh, small, lowercase i, lowercase i, dot com, yeah. so Terra2.com. And so now we have about 10 million, say, plus or minus Americans that, are that have filed for unemployment in the last couple of weeks. That number could swell to as much as 50 million, some estimates say. Um, and so we are looking at a, a, a big calamity for the economy. What, are you, what is your position on the, on the opportunity and how that relates to the clean energy economy? Sure. Um, yeah, Tim, that's a good setup. Um, we have the pandemic, we have, you know, the Fed papers saying almost 50 million Americans might be unemployed by the end of this quarter. That's a lot. That's more than the Great Depression, much faster unemployment rate, a uh, drop in the unemployment rate. So it is a big problem. And uh, just kind of think about where we are at. We're in 2020. Um, I think that we can use this uh, problem as an opportunity to grow America to something that we never imagined it to be uh, in just 10 years. We have so m millions of Americans entering the unemployed. That's millions of Americans that's at home and we can teach them skills that uh, relevant skills. And that's millions of Americans ready to come back to work in matters of months, as soon as the economy gets better. Uh, more specifically, as soon as the virus situation gets addressed. Um, and with that, I think that, yeah, a lot of opportunities here. So how does that work? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, underst I understand that companies are having to furlough and lay off workers in, for example, the food industry or mm -hmm. the hospitality industry. Many factories are closed, and so those workers are furloughed. Um, and there is obviously also now a growing part of the economy for companies that make PPE, that make face shields and masks and gowns mm -hmm. and gloves and respirators. Um, so that's one growth opportunity. I spoke to a, a, a green building entrepreneur today earlier, and he is now spearheading an initiative in building mobile ICU units. And wow. he, works, he works in what's called the offsite construction industry or prefab construction. And so crisis is opportunity. Uh, it won't necessarily be an opportunity for all sectors and all workers, but right. how do you see, if, if I'm a hospitality worker, for example, what is the clean energy opportunity for me? Sure, sure. 
uh, that's a good that's a good question. Um, the clean energy opportunity is really how you would look at it is look if I'm an unemployed person, um, we have to first think about which industry they used to work in, right? Like you said, hotel, or is it something that is an industry that is going extinct now? For instance, let's use the most extreme example: oil producers. There's a lot of oil rigs going out right now because the economy is bad. Now. There are jobs that after the recession will remain, like hotels and restaurants. We need those businesses still, and they'll come back. There's a lot of jobs that will not remain anymore. And that's where that's sort of the part of the economic question we're trying to fill with this green energy uh, you know, opportunity. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a structural unemployment, which is a long-term unemployment, um, that occurs because people don't have the citizens of a country doesn't they don't have the necessary skills to perform or create a certain industry right and what we're talking about right now is that um, at this point in time the solar industry the clean energy energy industry has a lot of opportunity we need a lot of people to advance what the industry wants to do there's a lot of capital going in there into this industry there's a lot of companies uh, like yours Tim that are becoming um, that are expanding and I think that, uh, you know, we can really, uh, so one thing that Terra2 is doing is we are uh, trying to uh, work with a nonprofit, uh, solarenergy.org. They have um, all these videos that teaches relevant skills to enter the solar industry. Uh, we're trying to work with them to see, hey, uh, can we get more people access to the videos so they can learn during this time? And with a few months, the unemployed people are, you know, at home, they, you know, they have access to computers, they have access to tablets. Um, so we can use that to teach them the skills to be prepared that once after the pandemic is over, if the government is willing to push some sort of a stimulus centered on clean energy, um, we can make things work. We can have another boom uh, in America. But it needs preparation and it needs action today. Um, yeah. So I guess that's one of the questions that I have, though, is can you repurpose a workforce that's doing things like food service and hospitality work to work in the clean energy industry. So, some of those workers, of course, can retool. But for example, one of the shortages in clean energy is skilled labor, mm. uh, say, say electricians or carpenters, people that have years of training and do very technical work with technical equipment and infrastructure, how does you know a waiter or somebody who's uh, a receptionist get into the clean economy? That's a really good question. Um, we wrote a blog post on this, uh, but you have to. So taking a step back, Tim, to answer your question, I think what you're you are uh, really focused on is. Sure, we have, you know, Dave, we have all these people, right? Um, who are looking for jobs. And we have this industry that has a lot of jobs. But how do we, you know, create that pipeline connected to the people with, you know, that need jobs and the jobs, the skill mismatch, we need to connect them. And that all comes from training and education. Um, and we need a governmental, uh, especially at this time, we need a push to uh, equip the people to be able to transition. It's not just a matter of, hey, go this, uh, to go do another job. You need to have the skills to do that. Uh, and you're right. And I think that creating that education and training pipeline is critical. I mean, it needs to happen now. Um, and that's really the point. Like, um, there's no way we can do that right now. There's no way we can, you know, transition millions of Americans to a whole different industry. We can't do that in a way that is that won't create a lot of uh, economic consequences and a lot of confusion. Um, so that's something we need to focus on today. And that's really the thing. We need to understand where the end goal is in order for us to create a pipeline with the targeted end goal so we can be able to train people with a, with a, you know, a goal in mind. I mean, right now, clean energy, clean energy future is a really good goal to pursue, to create jobs around and push capital to it. So if you, were, uh, if you were in Congress 
and considering how to spend stimulus dollars, where, where does Congress need to shine a light? Because there's so many ways, and, and maybe it is simply, it's, uh, it's a myriad of ways. You know, I think of uh, the IBEW, which is a, a union for electrical workers, and they have training opportunities. And then there's online courses that you could take. Um, but, but it feels also when, when you say the government needs to, you know, provide training, it feels very nebulous. How or who is, who is spelling this out in some concrete ways that lawmakers can act on? It's a good question. Who is it? Um, I don't know the answer, Tim. Uh, but I think that um, what we can do at least, right, as private companies, right, we can create such pipelines, right, um, such hiring pipelines. We can do that ourselves. Um, and that's what really Terrace is focused on. Um, we aren't waiting for the government to act. We have a lot of organizations like Solar Energy that's trying to create this pipeline. So what they do, Solar Energy, why I really like solarenergy.org, uh, they had these videos at the very end of the videos of these cl online classes we take to train you for um, you know solar industry and specific skills in it, whether you know electrical work or construction. Um, at the very very end, uh, they give you once you complete the courses, they give you a uh, certificate that tells you, hey, now you are able to be ready to do the perform these skills because you took the courses. Uh, and that certificate, you can use that and go to your employers and say, hey, look. Um, you needed these qualifications. Well, I learned it. Look at this. And that's, I would say that's a really, really targeted way, a real actionable way where we can, um, you know, um, help people go towards the energy, clean energy industry, right? And what, what, is, what does that need in that kind of pipeline? Um, we need to be able to reach out and show people that this opportunity, this training and education opportunity exists. People have heard. Yeah, that's the first step. Yeah, and I want to, uh, so I'm sharing my screen now, and this is the SEI Solar Energy International website you mentioned. I myself have taken several courses here, so I, I agree that this is a great resource. What I did is, is just clicked on the online courses opportunity here, and so you see configurations of a PV system with energy storage. Solar and storage is a very hot topic, especially in markets like California. Um, introduction to renewable energy, thermography and drones in PV applications. I'm very happy to see this. Drones are now uh, really coming on strong in the, in the solar industry um, and, and other energy industries. Uh, key tools and techniques for PV system O&M. Uh, so anyway, so yes, this is, this is a tremendous resource. And uh, I would also point people to SEIA, the Solar Energy Industry Association. Um, I'll, I'll just go to that website while we're talking. But so I, I agree. Yes, there are some, some existing resources. Um, but many of these professionals, we have to remember, David, are not so inclined to school, right? These aren't people that necessarily went to four-year college. And they may, they may have some certificate uh, or a two-year degree, but many of them only have a high school education. And, and so that could be a significant barrier to entry. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not you know, trying to rain on this parade at all. I think that this truly is an opportunity for people to transition into the clean energy economy. We have such a need. And, and let's talk just a little bit in high level about that need because my understanding, and, and uh, I'm, no, I'm no expert on the energy transition, but I, I certainly have been studying the transition and what is required right. and what is going to happen in society. And, and so some of the metrics are, for example, that as we electrify transportation, right, we're, we're converting from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, we are going to triple our demand for electricity on the grid, okay? Mm -hmm. That is a huge amount of infrastructure that we need to build. We literally need to rebuild the grid from soup to nuts because much of it is aged and causing things like wildfires as we've seen in California, right? Um, so, 
then of course there's just the energy generation right we are we are in the transition from uh dirty fossil fuels coal and oil and natural gas to clean wind and solar wind and solar are now uh, the most economical sources of new energy and solar you know was last year the number one source of new energy uh, in the u.s and across the globe right it has surpassed all other sources of new construction for new power generation. And that's purely because of the economics of solar. It's it, as much as I'm interested and you are interested in sustainability and greening the economy, this is just about what is a good investment for institutional investors who want to own and operate assets and see an ROI on their, on their investment, right? Exactly. Um, do you have any do you have any personal thoughts about the energy transition and the oper the scale and scope of this opportunity? I actually wanted to ask you, Tim. Um, you mentioned that uh, you're in a situation where the Great Recession, right? I do transition into the clean energy um, after the Great Recession, after you lost your job. So yes. I was wondering um, if you're okay with that. Like, maybe could you share more about, hey, uh, how did that work for you and um, what are the things that could have been better? Um, I don't think many things would have changed since then. Uh, yeah, so I took a winding path to the clean energy economy. I grew up in New Mexico. My dad was interested in solar energy. And so we were doing DIY solar thermal. We made uh, hot water panels. We were making solar cookers. Uh, obviously, New Mexico has great solar resources. Solar PV was not on the scene. This is in the early and mid 70s. And wow. solar in those days was over $100 a watt. And wow. now we're at less than a dollar a watt. So solar was on the scene, but only in exclusive uh, applications like mountaintop telecommunications or satellites. Mm. Those were the common applications. You didn't see solar being used on homes, certainly. Right. And then uh, in the 2000s, that started really in the U.S. to to go mainstream. But in 08, I was working for the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum in Chicago doing corporate relations. And when the economic crisis happened in the, in the late summer and early fall of 08, uh, the financial markets right went into chaos and money got very tight and the museum laid off several of their uh, several of their staff. I was one of those. And at the time, I was looking to get into higher education fundraising. And so I just made a strategic decision to move to Champaign-Urbana and work for the University of Illinois, even though there was a hiring freeze on at the time. And, um, but I knew with my skill set, I have a strong background in technology and science and fundraising. And uh, sh sure enough, I got a job for the Beckman Institute mm -hmm. of Science and Technology. And it's a multidisciplinary research institute. It brings together the biological and behavioral sciences with the physical sciences under one roof. And I, I did that for three years and that was a lot of fun. And then I got uh, involved with the Passive House Institute. It's known as FIAS and started doing some corporate relations and fundraising work for them. And that was my segue to the green building arena directly. And then in 2016, I was cold called by a Canadian who said, hey, have you realized that we've reached grid parity with solar? You need to look at this. And he was doing consumer to consumer solar. Um, and so that's at, the, at that time, I was purely consulting and looking for new opportunities. And of course, uh, sustainability and and making the world a better place were kind of in my blood. And I started to then look seriously at solar and then got into solar full time and then came to Continental in the spring of 2017. So truly the crisis of 08 was an opportunity for me and my family. And, and uh, Champaign-Urbana has been a great place to raise my children who are now almost all emancipated. I have, uh, my youngest is still at home. He's a senior in high school and he'll be um, moving to Norway this summer to uh, follow in his brother's footsteps. So both my kids will be living in Norway and I have a strong relationship with Scandinavia and we should probably talk about Europe because the Europeans are 10 years ahead of us in terms of adopting a Green New Deal. 
and really stepping on the gas and, and uh, you know, modernizing their infrastructure from a transportation and energy perspective. So crisis is opportunity. It, it definitely has benefited my life. And I'm just kicking myself, honestly, David, that I didn't get into solar when I was living in California, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, literally, I could have worked for SunPower in the early days. And, um, and it truly is one of my, my greatest passions. So I'm just thrilled that I'm, that I'm here now. And kudos to you for, for seeing the light sooner in your career. And, and I tell my kids, you know, if you get into energy, you have uh, 50 years of just pure growth, right? This is a growth economy, even though this is going to be a downturn for everyone for a little while. I don't want to minimize that, uh, you know, even, even, uh, even in solar, right, there is a contraction going on now. And there's a lot of news coming out of organizations like SEIA that you see here on, uh, on the screen and, and others about, you know, how this is impacting the clean energy economy. How long do you see this, this downturn um, lasting? Yeah, yeah. Um, by all means, um, no one knows that answer. But then, kind of thinking about, um, you know, the most important thing, right, that has to happen, is that we have to go back to work. People have to go back to work, and for that to happen, the virus pandemic needs to be addressed. So, let's say that, you know, according to the government, by the end of summer, you know, summertime in the summer is when a lot of flu and viruses disappear. Um, let's be optimistic and say that is approximately when the economy will start rolling back and people will go back to work, right? From then on, um, you would expect at least a few more quarters to be a little bit sluggish because there's going to be recovery. Things take time to recover. Um, we don't think, maybe Q2021, um, optimistically, uh, we should see some you know, recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we don't, this, this, this downtime is caused mostly by the pandemic and a correction. So it's not like the Great Recession where we had a systematic uh, sort of fragile, uh, sort of a fragile system um, in the financial system that needs to be fixed. It's nothing like that. I think structural. Uh, so the recovery will be swift. It will be fast when it comes. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I, uh, I am not an economist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you know, I do see stories basically pointing in both directions right now. Some people are saying the economy is going to bounce back fairly quickly. Some people are saying, mm, probably not. This is going to be a longer road to hoe, so to speak. And of course, time will tell. Um, you know, but it's clear that the government is interested in supporting the economy. Um, they're, you know, they're now making substantive, taking substantive action on, you know, uh, sending checks to consumers and, uh, of course, attacking the, the war with the coronavirus. But this is probably just a very early stage of their reaction and there will be more there will be more incentives coming out from the government. Um, the, the Green New Deal, that is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Jeremy Rifkin has a great book by that title. There's half a dozen books by that title now. And what surprised me when I read the, the, the Rifkin book, though, was that China and Europe and Western Europe did Green New Deals 10 years ago. And literally, he's been running around the globe consulting with governments and helping them figure out how to prioritize, how to spend money on upgrading their infrastructure and modernizing their economies. Wow. And, you know, China has a, a, a very long-term plan to be 100% wind and solar powered. I've heard it referred to as a 100-year plan. So it's a long-term and obviously, in a planned economy like that, you can do that. You can't do that in the United States. Uh, we, we, we have, you know, these four-year or eight-year cycles. But why, what I don't understand is why it takes the coronavirus and the subsequent economic hit for the U.S. government to really see the opportunity, right, to 
support the economy because it's such a win-win. One of the great statistics that Jeremy points out in, in his book, The Green New Deal, is that for every dollar invested in green infrastructure, the economy grows by $3. And that's, uh, this is long-term high paying jobs, right? Electricians, just to give one example, are making $50 an hour at the lower end, right? As, as a trainee, they're making $30 an hour, which yeah. you, you can't shake a stick at, right? In most industries, if, if you're a, uh, you know, if you work in food service or if you work in hospitality, you're lucky if you break the $20 an hour mark, right? Right. So, but what is your perspective on, on, on the Green New Deal and, and that opportunity? I think it's great. Depending on which new, uh, deal we're talking about, like you said, there's multiple versions now. Um, but yes, I agree with it. It's a great opportunity. We just have to figure out how we can get it done in a way that is feasible, uh, that Congress will allow, and that can be done as soon as we can in the most efficient way possible. Um, 100% agree. But at the same time, the U.S., um, I think you mentioned that you know, China and Asia, we ha they, they have so much more renewable energy than we do. Um, Europe is 10 years ahead of us. Um, I think America is finally learning its lesson. And the first time in its history that um, capitalism has its limits. It does. Um, and I think that's one of the sort of the... Um, uh, balances that we need to learn from the pandemic as Americans uh, and recognize that Europe and Asia, they have elements in their society that um, sort of hedge against capitalism that we Americans don't have. And we see that um, kind of affecting our actions today. So you ask, hey, why did we not uh, address this as such a win-win? Well, I think the problem is, is that when you invest that dollar, Tim, and get that $3 back, is over time. And I think we've kind of, America has grown into this capitalistic society and capitalism is great for innovation. Um, you know, it's great for pushing and drive. Um, but um, we come to a point where uh, the amount of economic opportunity left is being squeezed in the short term. So of course, the stock market, right? People really, really, they really care about quarter to quarter uh, growth. Um, but when we think about $1 invested and $3 back, that happens over years. Um, so sort of that mentality of uh, the timing mentality, the timing mismatch mentality uh, is very prevalent. And I think that's something that uh, we really need to fix. Uh, we have to fix our mentality, we have to fix our values uh, as Americans from the very, very core. Um, and that's how we're gonna be able to come back from this because if we can't, we're gonna be left here. Um, you know, our, the political parties we keep arguing each other. We're never going to get anything done efficiently. That's best for everybody, for right, for Americans. Um, we're going to be doing things in a suboptimal way. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our founding fathers have set a very, very good, like, amazing, intelligent design and framework with the Constitution and the balance of powers. And we're seeing that in play right now with the pandemic. Um, we need to. Uh, really see this level of um, sort of uh, reprioritizing our values as Americans and our focus and really just focusing right now on this decade was really important to us. And I think in the next 10 years, we'll see, we cannot be the same American anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what the pandemic has taught us. We have to do, do things a little differently, we have to. And it comes with that, it starts with the values. Um, we have to do that differently or else, you know, um, I agree with you. I don't see how we are going to make a different choices, right? Um, than before the pandemic, if we don't learn that lesson from the from the pandemic today. Um, yeah, we are kind of caught with our pants down because 50% of the American population is considered low income. 20% of the population is living in poverty. And, and so it is, uh, it is those populations and those are massive groups, okay? We're talking over 100 million people in the United States that don't have adequate health care, don't have adequate access to education. And uh, so 
you know, helping them into this new economy is going to require some heavy lifting. Um, and it and it draws a stark contrast between us and Europe. So, you know, one of the things I'm just tickled pink about with my children being half Norwegian. So my children's mother is a Norwegian citizen by birth. And so they're half Norwegian, half American, they're dual citizens. In Norway, which, you know, is a unique economy. It's a very small country, 5 million people. It's very wealthy from North Sea oil. And, um, but they take care of their own, right? There, there is a floor. And it is a capitalist economy, right. but it is an economy that takes care of people as well. It doesn't leave them behind. And the American economy, as great as it is, it's the biggest economy in the world. It, it, you know, it has birthed so many amazing innovations like you know, Silicon Valley, right? And all those companies that come out of Silicon Valley or Washington State, it's, it's awesome. And it's unparalleled. And I love that about being an American. And I choose to live in America. I don't choose to live in Europe. I could live in Europe, but I choose to live in, in the United States. But it does concern me that we're in a position now where we have such a large population that is not um, protected right. you know, from these forces. And it's just no fun to... Uh, to be poor in the United States. It's, it's no fun anywhere, and, right. but, but it's particularly treacherous when there's not a system to care for, uh, for our less fortunate. And it's really just sad. It's just sad. And it's unnecessary yeah. because we are the richest country in the world. Yes. And, um, you, know, you know, we've just unfortunately what what has been transpiring for the last 40 years is this divide between the haves and the have nots and that just cannot continue right because the pitchforks will come out eventually and people will burn the system down so i don't want to see that happen but if you're a have not you don't really see an alternative uh, unless the government starts to provide a floor right so and I agree with your comment that we cannot be the same America when we come out the other side. And so that's another opportunity, right, is for us to transform ourselves societally to step up and be better human beings and be better citizens and to be there for each other, right? We, we have to stand shoulder to shoulder and take care of each other. Yes. 100% agree. That's what America is based on. The whole world looks at America for that reason, and we're failing in that. The world's like that right now. But we can still turn it around, right? People look to America for hope, right? Everyone, all the different foreign countries, uh, when they say, that, hey, our situation at home isn't working out, people come to America. Uh, we have a pretty big responsibility, like you said, Tim, um, to make sure that uh, when we do come out the other side, uh, we show that we still hold on to our values. This is a temporary, uh, you know, misstep by America. That's okay. Every country makes mistakes, and everyone has something to improve. Um, but really, it's just a few weeks right now where we're working at home. Um, some people may have lost their jobs. It's a good time to just uh, sit back and you know reflect on yourself um, and just try to understand the situation, uh, empathize with other people no matter, you know, who you are and who they are, and just try to focus, really focus on uh, creating a better world for everybody once we all come out um, from our caves. Um, and that's analogous to the New Green Deal, is it not? Um, that's really, you know, how, um, you know, how terror to seize this opportunity. It's not just an economic opportunity. It is an economic opportunity. Um, solar industry, like you said, has is booming. And there's a lot of, you can make a lot of money from different jobs in the solar industry. Um, so it's a great economic opportunity. But also, um, when we go ahead and do that, we have to do it in a way that demonstrates a shift in values. And only then will our um, you know, long-term actions really um, uh, 
uh, be done and performed in a way that is consistent with our long-term values. But we have to decide on that. Like, what is it? You now, the short-term stock market, do we care about that more? Or do we care about the long-term stability and sustainability of our country? Yeah, and maybe it's both. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know what, what is, uh, there, there's a chicken or the egg problem here, it seems to me, in terms of our values. And because we are such an independent breed, that, uh, you know, this story of, of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is so integral to the US. It's not, it's not necessarily true. It's, it's a myth that we all believe, though. <laughs> and, um, and I don't know that, that people that are unemployed now or going to be unemployed in the near future are going to all have the wherewithal to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. You and I are, you know, we have a certain entrepreneurial spirit and a background that gives us shoulders to stand on to launch ourselves in new directions. And so we are able to pivot, which is why I pivoted. Uh, you know, in 08 and, and have landed on my feet. But, but it does it. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about about this, this very large population that doesn't necessarily stand on sure enough footing to to pivot. That's where uh, our focus should be then. That's the focus then. Yeah, that's the maximum impact. It can make. I think I, I learned something from this podcast. Then. Um, <laughs> Yes, it helps to talk through these things and think about them. So I'm, I'm grateful to you as well, David, for bringing the subject to the fore. I, you know, I, I am passionate about the energy transition, and I do see that this crisis is going to be an opportunity. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a big crisis. You know, here's that map that you, uh, that you like. The Johns Hopkins University website showing that over a million people are now confirmed uh, diseased with COVID-19. That's probably a tip of the iceberg, right? Because many people are sick and aren't able to get tested and be a part of this. Um, we are now yeah. seeing the doubling of, of COVID every three to five days across the U.S., Estimates are now that 200 plus thousand people may lose their lives in the United States. So that's, uh, that's a huge, huge, huge hit, um, you know, in the context of other disasters that have struck, um, you know, that's, that's a, that is truly a wartime loss on the scale of a world war. And um, it's very, very different, of course, but, but we, it's, it's, it's a good reminder, you know, that we do have to be on a wartime footing here. We do need to think about this recovery as a wartime recovery. You know, when we, when we decided to fight Hitler and we converted automobile factories to airplane and bomb factories, right? In a period of 12 months, we turned on a dime and translated our economy into a wartime footing and we beat the Germans. That was a Herculean effort, and it was a true coming together, and people sacrificed, right? There was rationing. Uh, you and I can't imagine that today, although when you go to the grocery store, you start to see that there needs to be ra more rationing, perhaps, of some products, especially PPE, of course, um, because our healthcare workers are on the front line, and many of them are getting COVID-19, and they are the new soldiers. And I, I do want to, you know, shine a light on, on our healthcare workers and the sacrifice that's being made by all the thousands and tens of thousands of doctors and nurses and related workers who are in a horrible situation now where they don't have adequate supplies to protect themselves. Um, so wh where, where, do we, uh, where do we go from here, David? And, and you know, maybe you and I can continue this conversation as the recovery progresses. I mean, obviously, the worst of the crisis is still yet to come. We're here in early April. 
some estimates are that the worst of it is going to hit in, say, uh, three weeks. And, um, and, then, and then we might, you know, uh, start, to, start to recover and rates go down. But uh, what, what, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's wrap this up. But what, what, are your, what are your thoughts about moving forward? Yeah, you know, happy to stay engaged with you, Tim. Uh, I think that's a pretty realistic con- you know, conclusion that the worst is still to come. So we still have to be paying attention um, and adjusting our plans accordingly. Um, but I agree with you. We need to really, this needs to be a wartime mobilization. We can, we can do it. We just have to call the shots and we just have to go all in. We do that with the pandemic and addressing the pandemic of today. Many people can't do anything about it. A lot of people will get unemployed. You have a choice to not sit around and play video games. You have a choice to go ahead and use this time wisely. We can do that. And as we emerge from this pandemic, it's a lot, like you said, hundreds and thousands of medical professionals working on the front lines, support them. And as we come out, we can use our mobilization efforts, address the pandemic and transition towards addressing climate change. It's a segue. Uh, transition. And that's sort of the macro picture I see. Yeah, you know, I mentioned that um, entrepreneur, his name is Dave Cooper, who I was talking to earlier, who works in offsite construction, and he's involved with this initiative to build mobile ICU units, so that as the crisis moves from east to west, the units can flow across the country with the crisis. And then post-crisis, that those facilities are built robustly to be repurposed as say housing um, could be low income housing. It could be medium income housing. It could be both end. And so that is the kind of um, innovation that we need to see more of. And this is, a, this is a great opportunity. I don't want to minimize the crisis at hand and the need to come together behind fighting the the immediate crisis of of stopping the uh, stopping COVID deaths. We need to flatten the curve, and we need to focus on that and remain socially isolated. And um, so here we are using Zoom. And I was an early adopter of Zoom. I love the tool. It is being stretched, of course. But um, we have the infrastructure to, to keep so many things going with yeah. remote work and, 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 and remote learning now. So if yeah. you are a displaced worker, go to, uh, go to Solar Energy International and, um, and start getting some training. And hopefully there will be training monies made available, right, to lower income people so that they can afford it because it's not free. Um, and, yeah. and, that, and that is another, uh, you know, consideration that retooling is a great concept, but it takes resources as well. well. So on that note, Tim, I want to say one last thing, if that's okay. Yeah. So I was talking to Marla. She works at, this is director at Solar Energy. Um, right now they're fundraising so they can raise funds to go ahead and pay for classes for Americans. So that's happening right now. So you know, there, is, there will be an opportunity uh, where, you know, solar energy, um, they're really working hard on that right now. So uh, pay attention to it. You know, it, look, it seems like they're, you know, doing a great job. It's a lot of generous people. Um, and they're really trying to, uh, for this court, really trying to make this training free to as many people as they can. Um, so, yeah, I'm in conversation with that. I'll let you know when uh, they, you know, go ahead and do that. But right now it is paid, but be hopeful. Uh, people are trying to do things differently. They are trying to make this resource available to more people. So, um, yep, it's awesome. So I put the uh, the donate page for SEI SEI on screen here, and they are a nonprofit based in Colorado. Uh, so if you have the capacity and inclination to make a donation, I think this is a great organization to support to help displaced workers get into the clean economy. So that is something concrete here, which is a great action item. Anything else uh, on your mind or, or other opportunities for people to uh, quote unquote, do impact investing? Yeah, check out our site. Um, 
email me, email my team. Um, we can, uh, yeah, so we, if, if you're interested in investing into renewable energy, solar specifically, um, we are developing a platform that will help anyone uh, with as low as $100 invest uh, into clean energy infrastructure. Um, we're scheduled to launch our platform by Q4 2020, end of 2020, early 2021. Um, but we do have a sign up where you can sign up. Um, so this is one way you can participate. Um, but we'll be releasing some resources. I'll send things over to you, Tim, over the next few weeks as well. Um, our, our company and our team are really focused on making sure that uh, we can spread the opportunity of the, you know, about the solar energy industry to as many Americans as we can right now. That's our focus. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, data will come in every week and we'll see what happens. And uh, we should keep in touch, yeah. Uh, there's a lot, of work to do, a lot of work to do to make sure that um, we can make uh, you know, America come back from this. Great. Well, thank you so much, David, uh, CEO and founder of Terra2. I look forward to continuing the clean economy recovery conversation.